Yeah. Okay, all right. Uh, we're going to start here about three seconds. So. <coughs> We'll call to order the Jacksonville City Council for this joint uh, meeting between the Osso County Board of Commissioners and Jacksonville uh, City Council. I'd like to call the uh, Osso County Board of Commissioners uh, to order. And I'd like a motion to adopt the uh, agenda. Motion. So, motion on second. Second. All in favor of saying no. Aye. 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 I guess we should get a approval of the agenda here. Move approval. Second. Any discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Mayor, I think the uh, first thing on the agenda is the uh, revaluation presentation. Mr. Cotton, we have somebody presenting that. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Harrison. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Mayor, Council members and, and board members. Thank you for the opportunity to share some information with you this afternoon regarding the uh, Revaluation that was conducted effective January 1st of 2018. Also sitting with me today is, is Kevin Turner, who's our appraisal supervisor. And basically, before we kind of get into the numbers, I'd like to just recap what the purpose that we do a revaluation is. Um, obviously, the tax assessor's office under North Carolina General Statutes is responsible for valuing all properties that are subject to taxation in the county and its municipalities. Uh, this includes real estate and also personal property and motor vehicles. Uh, when we look at our, our real estate market, we recognize that over time, real estate values change at different rates due to different factors, different locations, property types, and that. And this causes inequities in the tax base over time. Also, personal property is valued, revalued every year. So once again, the uh, revaluation process is designed to adjust all properties back to the current market value with the intent of creating a fair and equitable tax uh, distribution uh, for our citizens. The revaluation process, since we're on a four-year cycle, is sort of an ongoing process. In, in non-reappraisal years, our appraisal staff is busy reviewing property characteristics. They're out conducting field reviews, working building permits, and trying to verify that the characteristics that we have on file for each property located in the county uh, matches what's actually out on the ground. Uh, so if there's additions that are being made or buildings that are no longer there, those, those records are, are corrected to reflect what's actually there. We're also looking at the condition of the properties and uh, making notation of that. Um, as we get closer to the reappraisal date, the majority of the time is spent collecting, verifying, and analyzing sales data. Uh, this, combined with our property characteristics, are used to develop what we call the schedule of values, which are basically the rates that will be applied to the property characteristics in order to determine new assessments. In order to verify that our, our assessments are accurate, we do have statistical tests called sales ratio analysis, and this is more applicable to the residential side of the property. Uh, but basically what that does is compares the median sales price within each neighborhood to the median assessed value to determine if it's, if it's close to market value. Um, our guidelines are issued by our professional organization, which is the International Association of Assessing Officers, and also the North Carolina Department of Revenue uh, gives us guidance as far as conducting mass appraisals. Just a little bit more about the process. The um, Onslow County has been conducting in-house reappraisals uh, since the year 2000, I believe. So this is around the fifth one that we've done in-house. Um, one thing that we did change this time, our, our in-house staff conducted the residential reappraisals, but we did seek some outside assistance with the commercial part of the project this time. And one of the reasons that we did that is because it's, it's really, we find that we really didn't have enough information in-house available as far as rents and, and market leases and, and relatively few number of sales. We were relying in the past primarily on the cost approach to produce the initial valuations. And then during the appeals process, people would start bringing in income data and, and we were kind of working it backwards. And we tried to, to be more proactive in this case and, and look at a a contract appraisal firm which has the data, for, they, they have sales data for not only Nonzo County but regional other counties if, if sales data is not available for certain property types in Nonzo County. And they also have access to market rent rates and expense ratios and other things that are used to calculate an income approach. So basically our office worked in conjunction with the appraisal firm to conduct the uh, commercial part of the project. And I kind of wanted to mention that before we actually get into reviewing the numbers because I'm, I'm sure that that's probably where most of the concern is going to be or, or comments anyway with, with the numbers as we move forward. 
Um, I have several slides here which basically um, are giving you initial value numbers. <coughs> this is just raw data that's, that's based on what was on file when we mailed the reval notices last week. <coughs> uh, I did want to clarify that the numbers that I'm using in these slides are assessed values, and the reason I mention that is because primarily what we use for for budgeting purposes and tax bill purposes is based on the assessment, not the total market value in some cases. Uh, for instance, we have a number of exemptions, full property exemptions are not included in these numbers, but we have, a, particularly on the residential side, property tax relief programs, which grant um, a portion of the value is classified as exempt and it's not taxed. So these numbers rec represent the numbers that were on file as of last week with the exemptions taken out because uh, this is what would actually be being taxed at. Uh, this first slide shows the initial values broken down by township, and this is total value of, of all types of property. Um, at the top, and I don't need to read these off for you, but we have Jacksonville, Richland, White Oak, Swansboro, Stump Sound, and then on each side I have the county total at the bottom just for comparison purposes. So basically on the, the percent change overall, ranges from a low of minus 1.15% in Richlands Township to a high of 9.78 in Stump Sound Township. And the overall county number was 3.4% increase. This next slide is, is similar as far as the way it's set up, but it has it broken down by municipality, the six different municipalities which are located in Onslow County, starting with the city of Jacksonville at the top, And it shows a net change of the lowest of 0.35% in Richlands and the highest of 19.75 at North Topsail Beach. And once again, for comparison to the county number, the overall county number was uh, plus 3.4%. Excuse me. This, yes, sir. Uh, these first two slides are aggregate values of all properties, commercial, commercial and residential. Uh, the next few slides <coughs> basically do the same type of comparison um, on a township basis. First of all, we'll look at the residential. And basically residential is including several different property types. It's not only single families, it also includes uh, manufactured homes which are classified as real estate, townhouses, condominiums, um, vacant land or other land which may have like some type of outbuilding on it, but it's not, not actually a residence there. But anything that's not classified as commercial is, is just not dealing with the residential category for this purpose. And as you can see, the um, Township of Jacksonville was showing a 4.57% decrease overall, and that ranged to a high of uh, 9.88 in Stump Sound, which includes uh, Sneeze Ferry area and also North Topsail Beach and Surf City. The next slide shows a breakdown of commercial values by township, and this would include um, apartments as well as retail. Um, service shops, many stores, mobile home parks, basically anything that has a commercial use would be included in these numbers. And um, let's see, as far as Jacksonville was showing, 14.65% increase, and looks like Swansboro was the high one on this slide at 26.97, and Stump Sound at 8.21%, and the overall county uh, was at 14.79% increase. Uh, 19.75 percent that was for all of uh, commercial and residential it's that's correct yes, it's sir. broke down as stump sound in the next slide there is that that's including Sneeds Ferry right all the unincorporated areas as well as the beach towns and Holly, your, Holly Ridge your total includes for 2018 growth, whereas yes. the 217 figure is just basic valuation, right? That's correct, yes, sir. That would include anything that had been picked up and added for this year. So you don't have a figure showing just what growth was? Mm, no, sir. Okay. 
<coughs> I think we cover commercial by township, um, residential by municipality. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, once again, there's a pretty broad range there. Um, actually, shows the city of Jacksonville uh, decreased around five and a half percent. And ranging up to uh, increase in North Topsail Beach of 19.7 percent, and overall county increase of 1.18 percent. And as Chairman or Councilman Bettner pointed out, that does include the, the new construction new that's construction. been key for 2018 as well. Look at commercial by municipality. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, city of Jacksonville is showing a 14 and a half percent increase, and that's pretty close to the county-wide number of 14.79 percent. Then there's some variances among the towns. I think the Surf City kind of caught my attention. There's only like nine commercial properties there, and I'm not sure why that one's showing a decrease. But it might be something we go back and take another look at. But it looks like all the municipalities did experience growth in the commercial sector, with the exception of Surf City. Holly Ridge took a pretty good hit with increases. Yes, sir. I didn't realize there was that much commercial property in Holly Ridge. Well, it's, it's probably not that much. And, and one thing that that we always mention when we do our, our public presentations is we're showing 2017 and 2018, but we're actually looking at a four-year comparison because 2014 was the actual day that we did the last reappraisal. Of course, any growth that's been brought online since that date would be included in that 2017 number. Any, any questions on any of those slides before I move forward? As far as next steps regarding our office, obviously we're, we're getting into budget season and one of the things that our office is responsible for is, is, is providing the uh, municipal and the county finance offices with value estimates for which to base your budgets this year. Um, obviously during a reappraisal year that takes a little more analysis before I want to provide numbers because we have a number of things that are still sort of fluid at this point. Uh, namely, uh, value losses that will be incurred during the appeals process and also additional exemptions which are likely to come online. Uh, just to give you an idea of, um, of exemptions, when I mentioned these were, were <coughs> the numbers are basically our, our net taxable numbers, we do have a number of property tax relief programs which we administer uh, for seniors and um, elderly or disabled uh, citizens and also disabled veterans and uh, present use value which is an agricultural deferment program for folks that are farming or growing trees and the assessed values that you're seeing have been reduced by almost 326 million dollars due to these various programs uh, about 167 million being on the present use value deferments around 55 million on elderly disabled exclusions and another 104 million on um, disabled veterans, which we've actually got over 2,300 that are qualifying for that program now and around 1,100 elderly are disabled. So these numbers I'm showing you are not true market numbers, they're basically been reduced by those amounts. <clears throat> uh, one other thing that we, we talk about during the budget process is revenue neutral disclosure requirement. Uh, this was passed by the General Assembly back in 2003, and the main reason it was per passed back then was because most counties were doing an eight-year reappraisal and at the end of the eight-year cycle you were seeing these tremendous value increases and in sticker shock as it was referred to and this was a disclosure that was required, required the uh, county and the municipalities to put in, in their budget document what the revenue neutral tax rate would be uh, which is basically the rate that would be applied to the new set of values to generate the same amount of revenue as you had last year so that way citizens could use it for comparison to see if the reappraisal was being used to increase taxes on a, on a wide scale or not. I've Another already thing. heard from some of the folks on uh, commercial properties uh, that's got their valuation and of course they're going to go through the hearing process. I think Commissioner Buchanan has got some calls and maybe some of the other commissioners have to and talk to anybody else other than uh, Commissioner Buchanan but um, I've got calls but going back to the uh, revenue neutral when we set the tax rate which we haven't done yet but when we set the tax rate for the county it's going to be 
extremely difficult to set a revenue neutral rate when residential properties has gone down a lot of them and commercial properties has gone up well if the we said it the revenue neutral is only a disclosure requirement it's not a requirement that you have to adopt the revenue neutral rate it's, it's just a disclosure requirement that has to be put in the right. budget document and as, as i recall last reappraisal which we actually saw a net decrease in, in assessed value county why the revenue neutral rate was was somewhat higher than the the prior year's tax rate um, we we're welcome to assist the municipalities if they if they need assistance I think we provide all the numbers and I, I think most municipalities actually do their own calculations I know of at least one last time that I, I basically we basically did it for them <clears throat> what's the period for appeal um, the um, that's my next slide oh, okay. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> no, go ahead. I was just getting ready to cover that but basically once we mailed the notices out we asked taxpayers if they had a concern or requested an appeal for the value that to please contact our office within 30 days um, from the date of the notice which i believe was january 31st and we will plan on conducting the informal review process during the month of january and march and the informal review process is not a statutory process it's something that i think every county does in an effort to try to resolve any issues you know before it goes to a formal appeal type setting um, We've already, as you can imagine, began receiving phone calls and, and requests for appeals, which is expected. And it, it actually helps us out because during the, the review process, if we start getting a number of appeals in for, for a sp specific property type or in a specific location, that lets us know which areas we need to go back and really take a, a good hard look at. Uh, so we appreciate the citizens' input as far as that appeal process. Uh, something unusual. I had a friend call me today and said, you're probably going to think I'm crazy, but I want to see if you could raise mine back up because it dropped too much. And we've had, had a few few calls like that today, too. I've had folks call because if you in the military and you got a house that you you got orders or you got, uh, you know, you got to move and uh, relocate and you try to sell your house, and if you just bought your house and it's less than what you paid for it, a lot of people say, and we we already underwater with our house. We can't sell them because we owe more than what the appraised value. So that makes it difficult for those folks that's trying to sell their house to move on. Mm -hmm. And um, we get complaints that the value went down. Of course, yeah. we get a lot more complaints about the right. value going up. <laughs> I can tell you that. But and and, and our our staff works very hard during the review process to try to take account all information that's presented to us and try to come up with a fair assessment. And sometimes it does result in you know maybe a neighborhood wide adjustment if, if that's warranted or certainly on individual properties uh, but we'll be conducting that process during the month of uh, February and March uh, we've tried to make it as easy as possible for for citizens to access that system we we have a link on our website which is actually on the main page of the county website also uh, there's a commercial button and a residential button so folks can actually go online and basically the same information that was printed on your notice will show up on the computer screen you can just fill it out and submit it electronically it has the ability to attach uh, any documents that we may need if there's pictures or, or recent appraisal or any other information about the property they can attach it and submit it electronically uh, they can also just fill out the form it's, it's designed sort of like a mailer they can just fill it out sign it and send in their information with it and we'll review it that way and some folks actually you know prefer to come in and sit down face to face and talk with somebody and we'll certainly do that on an appointment basis also so basically that process will, will hopefully wind down around the end of march uh, we sort of have to quit taking informal review requests by the end of March in order to work the ones that we have in the system and send notices out so those folks know the results of those reviews before the Board of Equalization review starts. Um, that's the next step in the review process and by statute they have to convene no later than the first Monday in May and usually during the reappraisal year it's, it's probably that last day before we'll actually get them started. But that's a uh, five-member citizen panel which are appointed by the Board of Commissioners and their purpose is to hear and decide property tax appeals. Um, I think they may be on the agenda for tonight for appointment, as a matter of fact. But well, uh, February, March is an informal review. Uh, is it the end of March from February? Yes. First to the end of March. Right. Yes, sir. So we really need to, um, I don't know what lengths we need to do to get the notices out. I mean, the information to people that does want to you know have well, their all that information was printed on the notice uh, on the, we, on on the, the notice evaluation last week yes, sir. but i don't want folks to come in say 
April 1st and say, I want to be have an informal hearing because the deadline's run out. And that's well, what happened last time on the commercial end um, when the commercial properties in, in 2014, uh, people had missed the deadline, so mm -hmm. couldn't do much. But uh, it can will they be able to go to the May and June? Then they have the Board well, of Equalization and Review at that point, or the uh, yes, sir. The uh, okay. Basically, the, the informal appeals will will stop doing those at the end of March or taking new requests. But anybody that wants to register an appeal still can appeal their value. But instead of it being done through the informal review process, it would just go to the Board of Equalization Review. Okay. And typically what happens during the reappraisal year, <clears throat> well, in a non reval year, that board basically is open for receiving appeals for about a three-week time period. During reappraisal years, we usually extend it out to about six weeks. So if we start first of uh, May, we would at least be taking, have an opportunity to submit new appeals up until right in the middle of June. And of course, the reason this is set up in statute with those time frames is because they know that, that the boards have to set budgets and without knowledge of what their tax base is, it's difficult to adopt the tax rate. So it has to be a deadline built in there somewhere, in fairness to the governing bodies, to have the information, the most current information so we know what available before you set the tax rate. So we know rate. what the revenue stream is. Right, yes sir. But there's still plenty of time to, to register an appeal even if they don't file an informal review. And uh, up until the board actually adjourns is the last day to, to legally file an appeal for this year. And as you mentioned last year, a lot of folks got the reval notices and, and didn't choose to exercise the right to appeal or question the value until the tax bills went out. And it was kind of a perfect storm with budgets on the city and the county part last year where both boards were, it was necessary to increase tax rates. So folks, especially in the city of Jacksonville, got, got hit with a, a pretty big increase. But a lot of those folks didn't come in and, and complain about it until they actually got the bill and then it was too late to do anything. That's what I wanted to say. If we get the word out and get people to know that there is an appeal process, but I will say, and I've talked to a lot of people that went before the informal review, and after they had the informal review, they were uh, there was adjustments made, and they were satisfied. So most of all the people that I know were satisfied. I mean, you can't be 100 percent, no. but I just wanted people to know that there is a process. Yes, sir. And, and we try to be as, as fair as we can with, across the board. And um, we sort of covered the Board of Equalization Review. Those, those hearings will start in June, or it's no later than the first Monday of May, and hopefully they'll be wrapped up in June and we'll be, have a pretty good idea as what our tax base is before you have to adopt the tax rate before the end of June. <clears throat> um, beyond that point, if folks don't agree with the decision of the Board of Equalization Review, they can also further that appeal to the North Carolina Property Tax Commission, which those are more formal type hearings and they're, they're conducted in Raleigh. And basically just to wrap up slide, the effective date of the reappraisal was January 1st, 2018. So those will be the values that are used for our 2018 tax bills that will be mailed later this summer and due in September of this year. And with that, if you have any, that's the last slide I have. So if there's any other questions, I'll be glad to try to address them. Yes, sir. Do you have any opinion or feeling about how the income-based approach affected the commercial property as opposed to the comparables or how many were <coughs> judged one way say, as opposed well, to judged the, the other? Well, the process that was used, they basically conduct, compiled sales of different types of property, in other words, residential properties, uh, many storage apartments, <coughs> those types of things, and, and calculated what the market rate per square foot per sales price is. Um, they also, uh, let me put back to my notes real quick. Um, because I got a survey asking about, you know, your tenants, what your tenants right. paid and those kind of things. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> they, they developed a parcel rating criteria which includes the quality and condition of the property, the location, traffic count, uh, the size of the property, and came up with a, a rating ratio to rate that parcel so it could be compared to other properties in different locations. Uh, also used market income rates because they have access to that data that was really hard for us to get. Matter of fact, uh, we, we tried to assist them in that endeavor by sending out over a thousand questionnaires to uh, rental property owners and we had about a 9% return rate. Um, and obviously that's not enough to, to be meaningful. Um, they have access to more data than we do and they were able to use their data combined, combined with the information we submitted to develop 
uh, market rates for, for retail properties, for many warehouses, for apartments and that type of thing, as well as expense ratios based on what typical expenses are for those type of properties, and um, develop a cap rate that was applied to, to the income uh, to calculate the assessed value. They, all, um, they also, in addition to the sales and in income approach, considered the cost approach, and they actually uh, have a, a grid where they reconcile those values depending on the property type to come up with the, the assessed value. So all three approaches were taken into consideration. Replacement we'll, cost or just, was it the cost? Replacement cost, less depreciation. I it's see. referred to as the cost approach. Is there a uh, standard percentage that you apply for the reductions that you anticipate during the appeal process? Um, I mean, how do you? Yeah, we, we basically try to look back and, and estimate it from what we've historically experienced. I think we, we kind of know how many appeals we had last time. Um, not sure about the exact dollar amount. And of course, some of it. This time, what's going to make it a little more difficult is probably we're expecting more on the commercial side than the residential side, so that's going to make it a little more difficult to <laughs> anticipate, I guess. But, but we, we, as far as providing budget numbers, I always try to be on the conservative side. I'd rather be a little conservative up front, and then when it gets to May or June, we can always go back and adjust those numbers if, if we've gone through a substantial number of the appeals and we can have a better idea what the values are then, but we'll, we'll be able to provide some updates as we kind of move through the budget process. Any other questions for our tax administrator? I'm going to ask one more. Yes, Since sir. you've gone, there used to be eight years, and when was the last eight-year period? That they the last eight-year reappraisal was conducted in 2000. That was the eight-year period was from 1992 90, to 2000, and then we moved to a six-year cycle. Oh, there was six. There was a six-year that was done in 2006, and then it's been four years after, ever since then. And this is optional. Four to, four to eight is the range that you can choose, right? The well, at least every eight is all the state requires. Um, now, oh, counties can do them as frequently as they want shorter than that cycle you just can't extend it beyond eight and in order for that to change the county board of commissioners would have to adopt a new resolution all right you're welcome thank you the next uh, <clears throat> item is a uh, uh, crisis center update. This uh, assistant county manager Sherry Slater will uh, give us the information on that. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. <coughs> um, I just have a few things to update you on on the crisis center, and then I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. We are in the process of working with the state uh, division of mental health on the Dix Foundation grant. Uh, that grant was in the budget for Onslow County, the state's budget. However, there's still grant paperwork that had to be done. And our project, according to my contacts at the state, was different than any other project they had. So they had to sort of create a new grant packet for us. Um, and that put us a little bit farther behind in getting that done than we had hoped. But they have received all of our information. They've sent back a few additional questions, which I've resubmitted. Um, and so we should be on track for receiving the grant funds um, as soon as we start receiving invoices for the project. It is a reimbursement grant. As far as uh, the task force and the work that we're doing, we did have some visitors at our last task force meeting. Um, Craven County has met with us and requested to be considered to be part of the group. And they've requested that um, myself and Mr. Cotton attend their commissioner meeting on February 19th to uh, basically provide the same presentation that you all received the last time we met, as well as the updates that we've provided you since. So we'll be going and meeting with their commissioners, letting them know uh, what the process looks like and where we stand now, and um, determining if they're interested in participating and at what level they would like to do that. Um, we will certainly brief you all as soon as we know where that stands. Um, and the final thing I had to let you know is just that our architects informed me that the bid packet will be ready to go out within the next one to two weeks for the actual construction project. So we are absolutely on target for that. I think our date in the timeline was February 12th. Um, so we'll be, we'll be right on track getting the, the bid um, out. And then as soon as we know what the bids come back in at, we'll know what the construction project looks like and we'll be ready to move on from there. 
I'm happy to answer any other questions you have. Right now it's just sort of a waiting for everybody to get their ducks in a row. We, we did receive um, the feedback from the State Division of Facility Health, it's not facility services anymore, it's health service regulations, and they're the ones that determine whether or not the facility meets code for a, a crisis center. Um, so we've received their feedback on the construction drawings, uh, and it was very positive. So we're in a good place as far as that goes as well. Sherry, I have a question. Yes, sir. Are we not, don't, don't we need to be careful about bringing in too many counties? There is always because that. of the beds. Do what? How many beds do we have? Eighteen? Is that eighteen or sixteen? It's sixteen. Sixteen. It is sixteen. Um, the the Trillium's number of beds that we need is much lower than what we feel like we need. Um, so based on Trillium's projections, adding Craven County should not put us in any sort of um, peril for not having enough beds. There's always the risk, and of course the risk is on what given day, how many people need to be there. Um, the center is, the budget for the center is designed to be at 85% capacity, not 100%. The reason for that is obviously you want to have a bed available when you need one. So the idea is not that we won't take people to keep it under 100, but that as soon as we take, uh, as soon as an admission happens, they are immediately working on what that person's plan is so that their stay is short, whether it's that they get uh, services arranged in the community and are, are released as soon as they're stable, or they find a more long-term placement for folks who have a higher level of crisis that's going to need more intervention. Um, so the plan is that the stays be in the three to five day or five to seven day range, um, and that way those beds would turn over much more quickly. Um, it is up to, obviously, the partners involved whether or not any other partners are added. Um, at this point, it's, a, it's been a request, can they participate, and obviously there's always the question um, at what level they would participate. Well, that's my concern because, you know, Carteret and Onslow have been together for many, many years. Yes. And I'm just concerned about bringing another county in, and we don't have the beds for Carteret or Onslow. That's my biggest concern. Sure, absolutely. <clears throat> They're in our, Craven County is in our catchment, aren't they in our, in our catchment area? Yes, sir. So we would have to take their people anyways. You couldn't turn them down. So, to have the partnership. But they would have to participate, though, correct? No, no, not under the, I'll let you explain that. Thank Probably you. Yes, so there, there's, there's two answers to that, actually. Yes, we have to take anyone in our catchment area that's Medicaid or state-funded dollars. So anything that Trillium would have paid for absent this agreement, uh, the facility would still have to take because it's going to accept Medicaid, um, which is a huge part of the funding for it. So we, we certainly want that to be acceptable. Um, for folks who are no pay, who have no payer source, um, they're not covered under Medicaid and they're not covered under the state-funded dollars, those are the folks that the counties and municipalities involved would have priority. Uh, so if there were, for instance, a Medicaid person from anywhere in the Trillium catchment area. That's 25 counties right now, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, they might, basically, then Craven County can say, we're not going to give any financials. We're still going to get bids, technically. If they are participating in a, this task force, then there would be a commitment, a financial commitment. If they're not, then their, their citizens at large would not necessarily be able to come to the center unless they were um, under the payer source of Trillium anyway. <clears throat> Does that make sense, sir? Yes. Commissioner okay. McCann is right, but, but they are in the catchment area, okay? And the bottom line is when we talk to Craven County, okay, they're going to participate in this, this task force that they do. They're bringing something to the table with it. <clears throat> so the bottom line is they're not going to participate in this task force unless they have a commitment if they're that interested uh, to participate with us in Carteret County. So I, I know exactly what you're saying, but they are coming to the table with money, from my understanding, after talking to uh, Commissioner, uh, what's his name, Dacey? Yes, um, talking to him and, and the, um, with the understanding, too, that they're, catch, they're getting on board after the fact that we've already started this task force, and they understand the requirements as to what we're, we're trying to do. So personally, I welcome them with that understanding that they're going to contribute to the, to the uh, financial responsibility for, for this particular unit. But you do make a good point about that, but again, they're under the catchment area, so I think we should be okay. Has the task force uh, talked about any kind of uh, commitment from them, what kind of commitment we need from them, or what kind of commitment have they offered? Or 
I'm talking about financial. Yes, sir. Um, the task force up to this point has largely uh, allowed the individual members to deal with their respective boards on the commitment they're making, um, if I say that correctly. So, in other words, we didn't ask any uh, particular group to make a particular contribution. Each board, as you know, sir, our board of commissioners decided what the contribution would be from the board. The city of Jacksonville did the same thing as did the other groups involved. Um, and what we've done at this point is, is come to the, the place of how much total contributions we have, how much we still need to make uh, what we believe is the estimated um, budget for, and again, it's an estimate. Until it actually opens, we don't know. Okay. Uh, and the estimate is a couple of years old now because we started this process a good bit ago. Um, but the actual cost, of course, will come as we begin the process and the opening. Um, the oversight committee that, that our task force has recommended be established includes regular review of reports from the facility. Some of those will be reports on the number of participants or, or patients in the facility, uh, the, the time uh, that it takes for law enforcement to drop off and, and successfully um, exit after bringing a patient in, those sorts of things. But in addition to that, they'll be required to provide financial reports. So we'll be able to watch the financials of the facility and see what their income is, where it's coming from, um, and monitor the investment uh, of the various boards as well during that process. You made an interesting comment when you said that uh, Trillium's estimate of the beds needed was less than the uh, estimate that we had. How did, how did you base the estimate on on the 16 beds? Was it based on the size of the existing facility? Yes, sir. Oh, okay, I thought it might be. It and, is. And I was often wondering maybe money too. I know we're, we're trying to trying to take care of a need, but we're, we know we only have X number of dollars uh, available. Yes, sir. Our facility that we currently had available, which clearly was the most cost effective way to move forward, um, is a 16 bed facility. It's been previously licensed as a 16 bed, so that is the easiest license for us to, to get again. Um, in addition to that, a facility based crisis center is designed to be small. And so 16 beds is the max for a crisis center. You would then be looking at a second crisis center if you wanted to. Okay. Now, lots of communities that we visited in, in this process had um, a campus, if you will. So they had two facilities um, on the, the same, same campus. Okay. Uh, so there's some ability to share cost of you know, some back office functions and things with that process. But they still were two separate facilities with separate licenses. Will this crisis um, center be impacted by active duty military just in case Cherry Point of Camp Lejeune um, units are filled to the capacity that they're needing beds for their active military? Um, I can't imagine a scenario in which an active duty member would end up in the facility. The facility would have to be um, licensed to accept TRICARE, uh, and that's not a normal thing that, that would be, would be uh, that a facility would have access to um, because those those patients generally are seen on base. Um, now, that said, if someone were picked up in the middle of a crisis out in town that perhaps for whatever reason wasn't immediately identifiable as active duty, I don't know what might happen there. Um, but I would not anticipate that it would have an impact. Um, it's a good question. I'm happy to do some more research on it. It's not been something that has come up a single time, though. So, I'm, uh, the military, the military operates as a separate entity. Yeah. Uh, even though they're citizens of Wazoo County, they and they that we react to a particular crisis in the middle of the night or something. You know, immediate care or immediate attention is going to be given to them, but they're going to be subsequently transferred back to the military for their treatment facility because they have a facility on base uh, at the Naval Hospital. Uh, they have. Their team's in place, they have different programs within the military, and a lot of the military people are now, once they're evaluated and they need treatment, they're not even treated here. They're shipped out to either Norfolk or someplace else uh, where they're transferred and seek different uh, or additional training. So, <coughs> yes, initially it might impact us from the onset, but once they're identified, they'll be subsequently transferred. Well, don't they have a contract with Bridgewater Hospital for some beds? I don't have any idea, sir. Is that? They do. Yeah. Well, there you go. <laughs> that sounded very authoritative, so I'm going to go with it. <laughs> is, Michael, Michael, is that contract with Bremar Hospital for active duty, or is it for their dependents? Active duty. 
I, I think, think they have a, from what I understand, that Dr. Woodruff, I think, for dependents as well. Yeah, and mm -hmm. I think I'm pretty sure that Bryn Mawr takes private pay, Tricare, mm -hmm. and Blue Cross Blue Shield, and Medicaid and, and Medicare. Yes, sir. Yeah. So uh, maybe uh, some outlets there for relief for it. And, yes, sir. I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead, Dan. Finish. I'm sorry. Uh, I also want to point out that we still have additional facilities in our catchment area. Um, they're clearly not centrally located to our, uh, for our needs, but there are other facilities that exist and they're the ones that we currently use. So also the hope would be that some of this, uh, that as we take in the people closest to us, you know, the overflow for those would be um, impacted as well, that they'll be able to see maybe people that now are having to go even farther away. Um, to other communities, there are people being routinely shipped as far as um, Raleigh and Durham to other facilities. So uh, we do still have options within our catchment area. They're just not terribly convenient to us. I've heard this one at some other time, but what is the uh, what do you anticipate being the maximum stay someone would stay in that facility? Honestly, Mr. Mayor, I'm not sure what the maximum allowed would be. Um, we anticipate the stay being less than two weeks, but the average stay being in that seven-day range. The way it's designed, it's, the treatment facility is a short-term treatment facility triage. designed for to triage. A, it's triage. It's seven to 14 days. At the 14-day period, if somebody's still there, then they'd be reevaluated as to determine Fine. what other training, or I mean, excuse me, what other uh, treatment that they're going to need or what type of treatment. So it's not designed for long-term. It's just designed for short term, get the situation under control, triage it, and move the patient on to the right treatment. Same thing if they if somebody gets taken to uh, the ER department at Oslo. Once mm -hmm. once Trillium finds a bed for them, they ship them out and put them, you know, yeah. send them to the facility that they need to go to for whatever situation that they may be in. So it's just a. a basically a first aid station for those situations and then they move on to the beds. Sherry, do you have the letters of commitment? Who have you received those from, from everyone except Craven? Uh, well, we haven't gotten exactly letters of commitment. Folks have signed the MOA um, and my understanding is we have uh, Carteret County, the city of Jacksonville, and um, Onslow County are all on board with that. We uh, obviously don't have Craven because we haven't met with them for that. Uh, and we do not have it from the hospital boards that have been involved. So those would be additional ones that we need to secure within the next month or so. Thank you. What's the timeline now on the request for proposal for the service provider? As soon as we turn in the um, completely signed MOA with all the partners to Trillium, they will be ready to release uh, the so RFP for a provider. The proposal itself has been completed and drafted? And yes, sir. My, my last conversation with Trillium about the RFP um, was that it was with their legal department for its final review just before our meeting last month with the task force. So he indicated that it would be ready by the time we had our um, signatures. And as you'll recall, the task force uh, was part of reviewing that RFP and making sure that things were included in it that we felt were important. Um, and one of the things that you all added was that the oversight committee that will be established by these boards is part of that RFP. So when the provider bids on this project, they go into it completely understanding what's expected and that there will be an oversight committee that will be involved. So there aren't any surprises or, you know, there's no confusion about the fact that we'll stay involved um, in, in the process and continue to monitor the success of the facility. And we look for a potential opening. When would it be ready? What did we talk when do we about? anticipate? Is it August? We anticipate August, yes, August. sir. Uh, assuming bids come back in where they need to be, we should be on track. Any other questions? Thank you, Sherry. Thank, Thank you. you. Good job, Sherry. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, I think this one is. Okay, uh, <clears throat> we're going to get a transportation update, uh, the project update. We have Anthony Prince here. Our uh, transportation coordinator uh, is going to 
share with us some of his insight and information. I'm not sure if I have much insight, but I do have some information. Well, just give us the information then. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to be here with you today. Oh, I guess I should skip this forward. As you recall, the last time we were together, we were celebrating the amount of success that we had realized in working with the DOT to develop the State Transportation Improvement Program, what we commonly refer to as the STIP. Okay. Every government program has a good acronym. Ours is the STIP. And so in working with the state, we were able to identify more than $300 million worth of roadway uh, improvements alone that'll be, uh, that, that, we, that will occur within the Onslow County Jacksonville area over the next 10 years. The goal, of course, is to improve safety, congestion, community, as well as military mobility. And although that, that document was draft in September when we were together uh, before, it has been adopted. Our Transportation Advisory Committee adopted it in November, and it's also been approved by the state, and it's also been accepted by the federal government, Federal Highway Administration. So now all of these projects that, are, that were scheduled and were drafted before are now adopted and are moving forward. Recognizing the sheer number of projects that we have as well as the, the pace at which some of those are moving and also the level of complexity, uh, what we'd like to do is, maybe not at every single one of our joint meetings, but at most of them, we'll provide an update on these transportation projects as they move forward. So for the presentation tonight, what we're gonna do is we're gonna start with the ones that are most imminent, meaning the ones that are under construction or will be under construction shortly, and then we'll move forward to the ones that are a little bit further out in the future. Uh, not too far, mind you, because we're only really interested in the first five or six years of projects that are guaranteed for construction. Um, we're also going to focus strictly on projects that are located outside of the city of Jacksonville proper, so in the unincorporated areas of, of the county. Tomorrow afternoon, we'll, we'll, with the community update, we'll spend a little bit more time talking about the projects within the city. But we do have a very good balance of projects. So the one on the screen here, you're probably very well famili familiar with it by now. It's actively under construction. It's what we call Ridge Road Realignment. $3.4 million project. And even though we've had some bad weather, we've had some rain, we've had some ice, it's still on schedule. The plan is to have the traffic signal installed by the end of February, early April timeframe. And uh, once that signal is installed and operational, then should be able to drive on that road. Uh, the, the project schedule shows it being completed in early, or excuse me, late spring, early summer. Uh, but like I said, as soon as that signal gets put in, we'll be driving on it. The rest of the work would just be clean up to demolish, to demolish the old road. And of course, uh, to make sure everything's tidied up, drainage is, is working the way that it should. This is, this is an excellent project. And I should mention that this is also a project that's moved forward in light speed. It was about, Mr. Lazaro, you remember, it was about, what, three years ago when we had some residents come to our MPO meeting. They voiced concerns about safety, about congestion. Immediately we took it as our mission and it's under construction. Another project that's um, not actively under construction at this point, but should be by the end of the calendar year is the Gum Branch Road widening, uh, U4906, $9.3 million. Uh, this project is not the four lane divided section, which we've talked about with the city council several times before. This is actually a project that will add left and right turn lanes at some key areas. Also add two to four foot paved shoulders to the roadway. And uh, the goal is also to, to straighten out some of the most severe curves. In general, this is a safety project. It really isn't going to increase the capacity of the roadway that much, but it should make it a lot more comfortable to travel and again, it should increase the safety of, of the roadway for, for drivers on a daily basis. Uh, in general, the scope is from Jacksonville to Richlands. It's not very precisely, dis, uh, uh, it's not very precisely defined, generally from the Summers Hill School Road area um, to just south of his, the historic district in Richlands. But it's a good project. 
Ultimately, we will continue to pursue the, the four lane divided section for portions of Gum Branch, but this is, this is really the, the best project for where we are and what we can afford today. We talked about this one last time. This is the 258 Super Street project. So just right out here on, on Richlands Highway. This is mainly an access management project. Again, improve safety, improve the efficiency of the roadway. However, what we were also able to do with, in working with DOT is we were able to evaluate the current capacity of the Northwest Corridor intersection. And it's a little, it's a little oddly oriented. So 258 on this map is actually running uh, left to right. Northwest Corridor is, is north to south, and of course Pony Farm Road is, is on the bottom of the screen. But we were able to work with DOT on a capacity analysis for the intersection, looking at what is the capacity today, and of course, what is also the capacity and the needs for the future. Because we know that there's a lot of potential within Burton Park, and eventually it's going to build out. So with this project, we were able to look into the future and identify the improvements that we will need upon full build, build out. And the good news is, of course, that DOT is going to pay for all those improvements. So just to help you interpret the map here, the areas in orange, those are areas of existing pavement. The areas in yellow, those are areas that will be added under the project. So um, looking specifically at Northwest Corridor Boulevard, you've got an additional right turn lane there as well as an additional left turn lane. And again, this is all coming at the expense of the DOT. Another project just right down the street, the, the 258-2453 interchange. This one's moving a little bit slower than the one that, that I just spoke of. Uh, initially, both of these projects, because they were so close together, they were intended to be let and constructed at the same time. However, the Super Street project is a lot more straightforward. It's easier to design, it's easier to permit, there are few, fewer people impacted. However, the interchange project is a little bit more complicated. As you can see here, the, the final alternative that was selected was to uh, basically put the 258 bypass transition over top of Highway 53. So the two gray areas that you're seeing kind of on the center left-hand side of the screen, those are bridges. And if you're coming from Richlands or if you're coming from the base on the bypass, you'll just have a continuous flow of traffic, either north or south. If you're coming on 53 or you're, if you're coming from town on Richlands Highway, those will be your surface roads, okay? And there'll be traffic signals there with ramps that will allow you to get on and off of the new facility. The heavy left turn movement, that's really what we're trying to overcome the most out there. The heavy left turn movement will be accomplished by using the ramp, a circular ramp, what we call a cloverleaf, um, that's identified with the, level, the letter D. So again, initially these projects were intended to go together. However, for a variety of different reasons, they're probably gonna have to end up being separated. This one shows right of way in 19, which probably will happen. However, construction in 21, I'm a little bit skeptical of at this point. Any questions about this one? I, I'm sure you've gotten a lot of feedback on this particular project. Moving down to Sneeds Ferry, um, to give you a bit of orientation, two tens kind of running caddy corner to the screen. Uh, to the left hand side would be Highway 17. To the right hand side, you'd be moving off toward Topsail Beach. So the section in red that we're talking about is the section of 172 from Four Corners, basically to the bridge uh, over the New River. It, right there as you get to, as you start to go on to, to Camp Lejeune. Project here is scheduled for three and a half million dollars, right of way in 19, construction in 20. Um, we had a project meeting this morning and this one's moving really quickly. So I fully expect that uh, 2019 is probably going to be accelerated and 2020 is probably going to be accelerated as well. 
when all is said and done out here, it's basically going to be a, a traditional three-lane section where you have uh, two travel lanes going in either direction, and in the center you have a, a two-way left turn lane. And I should point out that DOT really doesn't do these anymore, but this was the best solution for this particular location. Uh, and in fact, it's probably going to be one of the last two-way left turn lanes that we see in the state. But ultimately, this is going to be a great project when it's done. There are additional improvements scheduled for Sneeds Ferry, and I'll, I'll get to those here in just a few moments. And C24 Access Management, this project actually runs from downtown Jacksonville all the way to Hubert. So it's, it's a very, very large project, and that's why it's scheduled right now for about $55 million. Uh, I wanted to focus on the areas out towards Hubert, though rather than towards downtown. You're probably familiar with uh, the improvements that were made at Hubert Boulevard about two, three years ago as you're heading out towards Swansboro. That's what we call a super street, or at least that's the, the DOT lingo for that type of facility. And, and the super street has been identified by DOT as the preferred treatment for the higher volume corridors, what they call their strategic highway network, okay? so. As this project is implemented, you're probably going to see a lot more super street types of configuration out there, um, particularly in the Hubert area moving towards Swansboro. Uh, one real benefit with this project, even though it's primarily access management, we're also going to be widening the 172 and 24 intersection. That's pretty sorely needed at this point. We're gonna be adding some left as well as some right turn lanes to help improve the capacity and reduce the, uh, the amount of delay at that particular location. Um, if you're not familiar with the Super Street, I'm sure everyone here has been on Jacksonville Parkway. That's basically what a Super Street is, where you really don't have any traffic signals, you don't have any crossing movements. Everything is, every turn is made either as a right turn or as a U-turn move. Another great separated interchange that we have. This is, uh, unfortunately, we had to cancel the uh, public meeting that was scheduled for last month. Really was interested in hearing what the public has to say about this project. But the, the location is Highway 17 at the New River Air Station gate, also Old Maplehurst. So some points of reference there. On the south side, or on the bottom of the screen, I should say that is the air station property. On the other side of the roadway, of course, you have all the commercial development that's out there, including the Circle K gas station, the Saigon Sam's, the Food Line Shopping Center, et cetera. The preferred alternative at this point, and again, this hasn't been to public comment, this hasn't been decided as, as the final alternative. The, the current alternative that we're looking at is what's called a single point interchange. If you've ever been to Raleigh to the South Point Mall, and you've gotten off 40 at South Point and you see that strange interchange, that's what this will end up being, okay? The reason that the single point works best here is because it's a very compact design, so it has a minimum size footprint. You think about putting a clover leaf down on top of that area, that's just a massive amount of property that it would consume. The single point is compact and it also handles left turning movements very well. So to, to further explain this design here, the turns would occur at grade level. Okay, so Curtis and Old Maplehurst, they will remain basically where they are today. Highway 17 will go over top of the intersection. You can also see that the proposal includes some service roads and, and a signalized intersection just north of the shopping center. But the intent was to leave as much of the commercial area intact as we possibly could. Another thing that we're working with DOT on right now, you can see the white um, line with the arrows. Uh, we'd like to see uh, a connector road included in this project. and and. They've tentatively said, yes, we're interested in doing that. But we would like to improve the connectivity between Blue Creek School Road and Old Maplehurst Road. And of course, that roadway would, would accomplish that. I feel like um, 
some additional connectivity in there is warranted because of the controlled access that was put in there when the bypass was originally constructed. But also there's a lot of very developable property in that area. And of course this would provide better access to it. Right of way in 2020, construction in 2022, and $26.4 million. 210 widening, going back to Sneeds Ferry. Uh, this project is guaranteed for funding, but it's still a little ways out in the future. I'd be surprised if we're actually building this in 2025. Uh, this is also gonna be a very complicated project. Initially, it was scoped as just a uh, very similar to what we talked about with Gum Branch Road, where you're adding turn lanes, you're adding paved shoulders, et cetera. But the traffic forecast indicates that there's gonna be a lot of growth in Sneeds Ferry, and with that, there's gonna be a lot of travel demand, a lot of cars. So actually, the project has evolved to become um, a four-lane divided section between Four Corners and Little Four Corners and then what we call a multi-lane section between Four Corners and Highway 17. So that's where you're gonna end up with the turn lanes here and there, maybe a three-lane section for a short distance where needed, but the primary improvements are going to occur between Four Corners and Little Four Corners. $46.8 million worth of investment. Again, construction in 25, I think that that's pretty optimistic. I'm not sure that that's really going to happen. But the project is guaranteed for implementation. One of my favorite projects, and I think it's also a high priority of our region, is to obtain some additional connectivity over the New River. Uh, the project here is the, uh, what we're calling the NC-111 extension. It'll basically connect 258 and Gum Branch Road between 111 and Ramsey Road. Initially, this will probably just be a two-lane highway, but the intent is to purchase the right-of-way, do the grading, you know, basically prepare the facility for future widening uh, that will minimize the, the cost. So we'll probably buy four lanes worth of right-of-way, we'll do four lanes worth of grading. We're only going to build two lanes worth of bridge because, of course, that's the most expensive part of this project. But again, the connectivity here it's just, in my opinion, really valuable. And what it sets us up for is it sets up for improved connectivity between Jacksonville and the airport. But then it also sets us up for somewhat of a bypass around Jacksonville using Ramsey Road. And while we don't have improvements to Ramsey Road currently programmed on the tip, uh, they won't be far behind these projects. So as additional pressure is put on Ramsey, we, w we will be able to fund additional projects to raise the capacity and the safety of that roadway. 41.2 million, uh, construction in 25. I, I think this one, um, well, let me back up. Since it's scheduled for right-of-way in 23, it's not guaranteed for funding, okay? It's outside of that guaranteed window. So the priority that we, that we have right now is to figure out how to cut 10 months out of the project development schedule. If we cut 10 months out of the schedule, then we can advance the project and make sure that it's guaranteed for funding and that it moves forward, okay? If that is the case, and I'm very confident that we'll be able to do that, then that construction time frame right there would also move forward. It's unlikely that it'll move forward just to 2024 I could see that project moving forward to 2022, 2023. The reason being is because we're not impacting that many property owners. The area that's being impacted, large parcels, few property owners, a lot of wetlands, so it's, it's the right of way acquisition process should be a lot easier than say with, you know, some of the other projects we've been talking about like Gum Branch Road and NC24, et cetera. Just a reminder, we talked about this last time, but um, anyone, by state law and federal law, anyone who is impacted by one of these roadway projects, whether they're a residential property owner, a commercial property owner, or even if they own a sign, as in a billboard, they are entitled to just compensation based upon the impact of the project. 
And you may have gotten some calls from folks who are interested in knowing, well, what's the DOT going to do for me? It's difficult to really answer those questions until the project is almost completely designed. Because until that point, it's basically just speculation. And it's better to not give detailed information until you're actually ready to give it. So um, the DOT generally won't engage with property owners on the specifics of you know, what is going to be their, their compensation package and when is that going to occur. So what I've been encouraging folks to do is to educate themselves. You know, up until the point the DOT comes and knocks on your door, you can easily begin preparing for that process. Online, you can see there's an image right there. There's a relocation assistance manual. You can download it from the DOT webpage. I'm happy to send it to you via email. Uh, very user friendly, very straightforward. It gives you all the facts. It tells you what DOT can and cannot do, when they're able to do it and when they are not. And then it takes you through a series of options if you're a residential property owner or a commercial property owner. You have different options that you can start to plan for as the project progresses before DOT comes to approach you. So it's good information. Again, I can send it to anyone who is interested. There's also a lot of information contained within our webpage. All the maps that you saw here tonight, those are on our webpage, easily downloadable. We've got links to environmental documents for all the projects, cost estimates. It's just a wealth of knowledge. So if I didn't cover something here, uh, you're, you're more than welcome to go to our webpage, see what we have, and if it's not contained there, just give me a call, shoot me an email, and I'm happy to provide information that, that you may need. Thank you. I'm happy to take any questions. Questions of Mr. Prince? Did a good job. Thank you. Getting off Thank easy. you. <laughs> I was looking forward to at least four or five questions. Thank you again for your time. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Anthony. <coughs> Dr. Woodruff is going to present us uh, with the downtown capital projects that we've got going on. Wasn't that many months ago your project looked like this. Now, contrary to popular belief, the person in the bright green shirt is not Jack Bright, <laughs> but this project is moving along. This is what it looks like as of uh, Tuesday of last week. Y'all are, are really to be commended. Coming across the bridge last night from my favorite Dairy Queen, which, by the way, your mother does a good job out there, sir. It's amazing, it's amazing the change in the downtown skyline. Doesn't matter whether you're on the old bridge or the new Popkin Bridge, or the Popkin Bridge or the uh, Phillips Bridge. It is truly amazing what your two major buildings in this part of downtown have changed. We're beginning to have a true skyline. This building is a great asset for downtown. The other night when I was coming back uh, after, after dark to look across the uh, vacant land that a certain city council member owns and see the three-story lights through the trees, it's really amazing. I know that over the last several years, the investment that the county commission has made in the downtown, it was not without some difficulty you had to find the money you had to face the taxpayers but i will say to you the effort that you have made into changing downtown is appreciated by the city council by the mayor and certainly appreciated by the city staff one of the opportunities that we have coming up is our waterfront if you will recall probably four years ago a joint commission our joint task force was appointed. At that point, uh, we had uh, Commissioner Buchanan and Barbara Eichner. We had uh, Mr. Lazara and uh, Mr. Willingham. In the meetings, one of the things we discussed was, what do we do with the parking lots on Ann Street? We found out at that time that there was a difficult situation because we had a grant that had been given by the Land Water Conservation Fund, federal government. The attorney for the county worked very successfully with Mr. Carter, the attorney for the city, 
And we're very pleased to remind everyone that within the last several months, we have received approval that that grant is now completely transferred across the river. Now, why is that important? As you move forward with your own building, we're going to continue to have parking challenges. We're going to need to decide, though, how do we utilize this property? If you'll recall, both governmental agencies had their properties appraised. And the appraisal came in generally between six and some between six and seven hundred thousand dollars on the county property and between six and seven hundred thousand dollars on the city property. One of the things we need to be deciding is what role will this property play as we move forward with downtown revitalization? A project that we have been working on for much longer than I ever anticipated was the Welcome Center. We're very pleased to tell you that the Welcome Center, which will be located in Jacksonville Landing, if you'll look at the graphic, the little blue area is where this will be. You, the top road, that goes across the Buddy Phillips Bridge. The bottom road goes across the Popkin Bridge. And of course, you, can, you have seen the tremendous utilization which we have had of, of that boating facility. I mean, it, seriously, the other day in the snow, I'm going out at 6 o'clock in the morning in the snow to check some road conditions, and there were five people out there launching their boats. I guess they were going to be ice fishing. I'm not sure what they were doing, but I mean, you know, it's amazing. But the utilization of the Welcome Center is important. Another thing that we're moving forward with is the old downtown marina. This is what it looked like uh, just a few months ago. Alan Baker and his folks with facility maintenance, Johnny Stiltner and their folks with street department, removed all of this so that we could save about fifty to $60,000 from a contractor. And this is what it looks like today. Uh, no, that is not the city yacht <laughs> that is there. The city yacht's actually a 14-foot boat that we keep in the fire department. But this facility is shortly going to begin to be improved because the mayor and council approved a $1.1 million bid the other night to put in a new marina. It will include a very nice boardwalk along the shoreline. It will also include a 125-foot pier that goes out to a 16 by 32 pavilion so that if you're downtown and you want to simply go out and sit and have a water experience, you can. Bring your lunch, sit out there. Bring your fishing rod. But if you bring your fishing rod, you better have a fishing license. By the way, there is no license required to have two hot dogs at lunchtime sitting on the dock out there. But all of that is going to be open to the public. Additionally, we're going to be putting in a floating dock system that will have 15 rental slips. We want to encourage people to use this resource. The New River was once something that none of us would use. Today, it is a phenomenal success of rebirth. And we hope by building this floating dock system that it will indeed be heavily utilized and it will be an economic stimulus for the downtown. The last component is shown in the upper right-hand corner, and that's the kayak launch. You'll be able to come, bring your own kayak, or in the current building that it remains on the property, we have a vendor who will lease you a kayak. So it's a good opportunity. Now, I don't know, uh, Mr. Buchanan, how long it would take a typical person to kayak from here to Swansboro, but it might be an interesting thing to do one day. That would be an interesting trip. But again, uh, a great benefit coming to the downtown area. Sturgeon City Building. City Council has awarded a bid. This, bu this building is coming out of the ground as we speak. It will be about an 11,000 square foot building, multi-use, completed in November of 18. That's assuming we don't have any more bad weather. Right now we're 19 days behind because of bad weather. But refresh your memory, it will be able to have three different meeting rooms or one very large meeting room. I was in a meeting at lunchtime at the chamber and the comment was made regarding the Bridal Expo and the fact that the Bridal Expo currently uses the Commons Gym. 
Well, these are the type of community events that are going to be available if people want to bring them downtown and bring them to the Sturgeon City Educational Environmental Center. All of this means that we need to continue to be working together. Uh, David and I have talked about, uh, about reactivating the task force. Why? We need to look at road improvements. Now in this graphic, college just down the street is your new consolidated human services building. This intersection, which currently today is shown in combination of gray and pink, that's a very dangerous intersection. So within the next year, the city is going to be eliminating those areas in pink, and we're going to be making it a four-way intersection where it comes in there at Bayshore. But these are the type of things we need to be talking about together. This is the new alignment. So instead of having to stop at college, you can see it will be a through street coming all the way to Bayshore. Safety improvements. Downtown, I'm sure if you have visited the Organic Market or Johnson Drugs or any of those other locations along there, including Boomtown, you can see that we've moved forward with our sidewalk construction. We're going to be undergrounding all the utilities in the four block area between the Freedom Fountain all the way down to the middle school. It will include streetscape, better pedestrian safety features. It will continue to have the angle parking, but great improvements are going to come over the next two or three years, phase by phase. And you can continue to see. This is an example of what the property owners and merchants ask us to do. They're, they have no problem eliminating the four lanes of travel. So we will have a movement in each direction in the middle, we will have some landscape features, but the crosshatch, which you see, will be where the UPS, FedEx, all those delivery trucks and so forth will pull in, so they will have a safety zone. And occasionally, the NC State driver, Mr. Warden, who is celebrating uh, his victory over other schools in basketball, will be able to make an illegal turn through that to be able to park on the other side of the street. But. These are improvements that the merchants have had real input in, and we're very pleased that the city council is beginning to fund this through our capital improvement program. And again, you can see the continuation of the improvements. What we'd like to ask is that the county, I believe you've already appointed two members to your task force. I believe, Mr. Buchanan, you stayed on the task force. I believe Mr. Price, Shortly, uh, we will be asking the mayor to appoint a replacement for Mr. Willingham. We'll also be asking uh, Mr. Lazare in his spare time if he would be willing to continue. But either way, we'll be asking for the task force to, to reconvene some of the meetings. Parking continues to be a major issue. We've worked with Ms. Bright on a number of issues having to do with the courts. We've been very fortunate that we've been able to assist the courts with some temporary facilities. There are properties that are coming on the market in the downtown area. We need to be deciding should we be purchasing some of those and if so, how can we work together on those? We also need to be looking at some remote lots. Recently we had a very successful pilot project between the city and the county and that was the downtown circulator. A dozens of your employees every day rode the downtown circulator. It basically free ride every 15 minutes. This past month, we ended that service because you're nearing the completion of your own building. But those are the type of things that we need to be talking together about. How do we work to address the issues of downtown revitalization, including parking? Thank you very much. I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Dr. Wood. Um, funding for Sturgeon City. Is, is, that, is, is the city funding that building project? That well, in addition to the $4 million grant the county gave us for that project. <laughs> <laughs> okay, moving back to reality. <laughs> no. uh, the city council did fund the building. The Sturgeon City Board of Directors is responsible for raising the necessary money to furnish and operate the building. City Council has recently approved a lease 
so that the operating, leasing, all of the activities that will go on there will be conducted by the Sturgeon City staff. The city is responsible for seeing that the building is completed. At the present time, I believe the uh, bid was about three, let's just say three and a half million dollars, but between architectural fees and other things, the city will have approximately four million in the facility when it is opened. Okay. So they're trying to raise money for their operating expenses. And for furnishing. Furnishing. Yes, right. sir. Now, I don't actually know what the budget is for furnishing, but it is their responsibility to raise the money to furnish the building. Some of, some of the board members has contacted some of the commissioners and asked us to, they didn't give us a dollar amount, but they asked us to uh, consider, um, you know, some tourism money uh, in this year's budget. So I hadn't had time to talk to any of the commissioners about it, but uh, I, except for Commissioner Buchanan, I think he got a call. I don't know if any of the other commissioners got a call from some of the board. <laughs> I got figured you did, but I don't think there was. Uh, I don't know what they were asking for, and they're going to apply for it. So, going to go through the application process and money. Uh, they're asking for tourism money, so I, we're just going to have to look at it and see what uh, pool of money we've got available and uh, deliberate on that based on what we've set aside for tourism because of, you know, everybody's coming at us for tourism money. We got the uh, New River Inlet with North Topsail Beach where we got a huge investment down that way with keeping the inlet clear and then uh, we've got the regular folks that ask for tourism money so we'll have to really see what we can put together and see what we can come up with uh, uh, to see if we can uh, able to, to fund that at all. <clears throat> but that's an expensive layout down there, what you've got well, in that situation. Yeah, the inlet is, uh, <clears throat> you know, I don't want to bring up a lot, but that is continually a dredging and uh, operational problem. And we have to keep the inlet open on account of that's the way the New River basically breathes. That's how our commercial fishermen and recreational fishermen and also our Department of Defense does their training mission and when they cut the money off, uh, when the uh, federal government cut the money off for dredging that inlet, it left uh, state and local governments, which is mostly local, to uh, fund uh, dredging and the cleanup and sand. You dig a hole here and you put the sand over here and the next time you have a storm, that sand that you put over here goes right back into the to the hole. So it's, uh, it's an ongoing, expensive, extremely expensive project. So, uh, but that's where a lot of our tourism money is going. If it wasn't for that, we'd have a lot of money to have discretion about, but uh, that kind of limits it. But that's just my thought about it. And hadn't talked to the commissioner about it, but we'll see what we can do when it comes time for uh, tourism money. Richard, the, the funds that you were talking about, is that their operational, they have a commitment of 75 per year? Yes, the Sturgeon City Board, let me go back a second. The $4 million project is part of a $30 million bond that the city issued some five years ago. <clears throat> the payment of the $4 million portion of the $30 million bond is paid by a combination of city money donation from the board, Surgeon City Board, and from City Tourism. Now the bulk of the, the rest of the $26 million bond is paid strictly by a city tax. But the Surgeon City portion is a combination of debt paid by city, TDA city, and the Surgeon City Board. Excluding the furniture. Excluding the furniture. So I don't know what they're asking for, but I believe what they're asking for is simply money relative to the furnishing of the building. But I'm sure Paula and the members of the board will clarify what they're asking for. We're very pleased to know that the project, though, is coming out of the ground. And this time next year, uh, maybe Mayor, you and the chairman could host a meeting down there in that new building. That'd be nice. Any yeah. other questions you have regarding downtown activities or any other activities in the yeah. city? <clears throat> yes, sir. Um, the, 
I wonder when we when we talk about parking downtown, uh, are we? Have you had anybody study the? How do I put this? But the technical stuff I've been reading. You know, we got you got Uber and Google and Apple and all. I think the four car uh, big manufacturers. I mean, they're going to be producing driverless cars in the next. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me. Actually, I saw a driverless, in, in, driverless car coming over here today. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I just uh, I just sometimes wonder how how far out we need to plan for parking when I mean it's not going to be that many years out that parking is not going to be an issue anymore. Well, remember, this is a public <laughs> meeting and you're on record as having said that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> if you, so, who knows? It has never happened. If you, yeah. so, if you see know. my car, I'll be behind the wheel. Uh, <laughs> or your wife will be driving you in a parade. I've seen that happen. Absolutely. <laughs> so, you know, you are correct. Uh, transportation changes are occurring. One of the things, though, that still amazes me is we live in a society where people will buy a gym membership and then fight for the closest parking space to the front door of the gym. If you can't see it, I mean, that's the reason why if you look at Target, you look at Lowe's, you know, Home Depot, any of the big shopping centers, they don't put their parking all around the building. They put their parking where every space can be seen from the front door. It's amazing. We have, and, and just not to belabor this point, but just to belabor this point, <laughs> we have adequate parking in the downtown area on court days. The problem is people won't walk three blocks. <laughs> They will they, not walk three blocks. They won't even take their shopping cart, which is over two, two stalls over to leave their car, you know, their That's shopping right. cart. So yeah, you're right. But we do have a lot of opportunities in addition to parking. When I ask for the committee to reconvene, it's not about parking. It's about a lot of other good things, especially like that waterfront. That's an investment. Another activity that I want the task force to be looking at is the city's own property over there where Onslo Inn was for all those years. It's been off the tax records for now, Mayor, what, 15 years? It's time for us to work together and look at how we can bring new investments downtown. And he brings, he does bring up a good point, though, because that has been a pretty big topic nationally in terms of autonomous vehicles and how cities need to plan for the future of that. But it's a good opportunity for us to get back together and look at maybe consolidating and taking a different approach on downtown parking where maybe we can get more with less footprint. But again, these are conversations that, that we need to have together because they're extremely important. Thank you for your courtesy. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Witters. <clears throat> okay, so here's the council comments. I guess we'll take a few minutes. I know you all have a meeting coming up shortly. Uh, give you an opportunity if anybody wants to make any additional comments while we're, while we're all together here. I just uh, thank everybody for coming and meeting and we can get a lot done together if we right hand knows what the left hand's doing and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to meet with the city and we intend to meet with all the municipalities the county does and we currently meet with the Oslo County School Board to work out issues and uh, projects that's really of concern with, with uh, the county and the city. So I really uh, think this meeting and joint meetings like this is very productive. And even though we don't allow public comment or public speakers, we will allow that when we have our meeting next door at, uh, in 30 minutes. So. Uh, if anyone's got any uh, questions of any of the uh, speakers that was here, uh, feel free to talk with uh, Traffic and uh, Cindy and uh, all the folks, that uh, our tax folks, about the presenters and uh, Dr. Woodruff with anything that anybody might have a question for him. Uh, we kind of stretched on time, but we've got to get into our next meeting and I think they've got to clean, clean this uh, electronic stuff up here. But uh, does any of the commissioners have any comment? I just have to say two things. One, I want to thank Richard for the Consolidated Human Services and that bus activity that you helped us with. And Anthony, 
all of our county employees. Is he still here? Yes. Anthony Prince, I want to thank you personally and all the county employees want to thank you for that left turn signal going on to 258. And with that, I'll thank you. <laughs> on uh, behalf of the council, I do want to extend our thanks for hosting the meeting tonight. And I always uh, enjoy the opportunities to get together with you all and share ideas. We've done a lot for, for our region. Let's continue to do so. Thank you. I entertain a motion to adjourn. Second. And second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Commissioners are adjourned. Y'all are adjourned. A motion. Move we adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. You, you want to stay. <laughs>